James Bond Nightfire is the sequel to James Bond Agent Under Fire. It was released in 2002 for the PlayStation 2, the Xbox, GameCube and Microsoft Windows, with this particular version developed by Gearbox Software. What's most interesting about the PC version is that it just flat out omits certain missions entirely, usually those when you're in vehicles like Bond's car, which was some of the better segments in the previous game Agent Under Fire. There's also literal jumps in the storyline at times where the next mission just doesn't explain the progression of certain characters, making it confusing to follow at times. As a result, the PC version is actually inferior to the console version, which is something you don't hear every day. So let's take a look at both the PS2 and the PC version and see what makes them different, shall we? Nice landing, James. Why do you always seem to end up on top? A lower center of gravity? This is pretty much your typical James Bond storyline, involving a maniacal villain intent on taking over the world, lots of cool gadgets to use, dozens of brainless henchmen to kill, and gorgeous beautiful women filling in as the supporting characters. Unlike Agent Under Fire, which was kind of a mishmash of all the other Bond incarnations, this version features a very well adapted likeness of Pierce Brosnan. Although he doesn't lend his voice talent to the character, and the guy voicing him appears to make no effort to sound like Brosnan in the slightest. No reception committee. The system's active. We need a comm link. See if you can patch in. But that's alright, because he's still Bond as we know him, and this time he's chasing after a guy named Raphael Drake. In the prologue, James works alongside CIA operative Zoe Nightshade, returning from the previous game, before jet-setting to Tokyo, where the biggest chunk of the campaign takes place. And he's assisted by another agent named Dominique, and a bodyguard named Kiko. Towards the end of the game, you get to work with an Aussie Special Forces agent, actually voiced by a real Australian named Kimberly Davies, who I even had an FHM poster of as a young lad. It's that classic let's fly here, let's fly there, let's bang her narrative that is something of a staple of the series. There's a lot of cinematics interspersed with the gameplay, from those that go upward of one or two minutes to something as simple as just showing Bond entering a new area, which lasts maybe five to ten seconds. And most of these are all crammed full of double entendres and cheesy dialogue, as well they should be. Sorry to drop in like this, but would you ladies mind giving me a ride? Across both the console and PC version of the game, these are mostly identical, though there are differences with certain characters. Both games, however, are practically the same in terms of base gameplay. This is a standard first-person shooter, which is all about killing bad guys combined with forced stealth segments and moments where you have to use one of Bond's many gadgets. Most of the weapons are based off their real-life counterparts, weapons like P90s, Desert Eagles, a Spaz-12, and so forth, and they've been modeled pretty well into the game. On the PC, the shooting is simple enough and easy to pick up, and then yet on the console, you pretty much need to use the manual aiming system, which brings up a red cross here for you to move around, as the auto-aim system is just horrible. In regards to the presentation, it's a little bit up and down, with the sound and music in general leaving a fair bit to be desired. Visually, the game doesn't look too shabby considering when it was released, but the environments aren't all that consistent. The PC version runs on the Gold Source engine, used most notably in Half-Life, and the character models and environments get the job done, I guess, but nothing more. I guess for its time, the PS2 version looks decent enough, though not as good as I remember it when I was younger, and it's far from the best looking game on the console. A few of the environments are also very small and can be finished in a couple of minutes if you know what you're doing and then some of them take upwards of 10 or so minutes with no mid-mission checkpoints. Forcing you to do the whole thing in one sitting, it's ridiculous. I don't know why so many console shooting games from this time never included checkpoints, but it just ages games horribly and there's nothing fun about retrying something 10 times until you get it right. You know when you get to that point when you're only redoing it because you don't want the game to win? Yeah, it's like that. One of the last missions in the game actually has checkpoints, which is nice, but I guess my point is the whole fucking game should have them. This problem comes up most during the vehicle sections. I mean, yeah, I guess they're fun and all that, but they're also extremely strict on ammo and armor. And what makes it worse is when they're broken up into small segments because they don't replenish your supplies and expect you to just keep on fighting with no resources. At its core though, the locations for both versions are by and large the same, and they both recycle this corporate building across multiple missions, and both end up on a tropical island for the game's finale. The PC version also shows an overlooked detail with Bond's character model, often he's wearing some kind of sneaking suit during missions, 
and yet his in-game model shows him wearing a tuxedo all the time. It's just one of the many ways that the PC port falls short. Yes, I know that rhymes. There's other minor differences as well. For instance, on the PS2, your objectives are pretty straightforward and often you can't move on to the next segment of the mission until they're all complete. And then on the PC, the objectives often aren't straightforward, spread across multiple areas separated by loading screens. Often when you find yourself stuck, it's because you miss the option to use a gadget somewhere or overlook the way forward that might not have been all that obvious. But where Nightfire really trips and stumbles, regardless of the platform, is its stealth mechanics, which are a little bit underdeveloped. Most of the time you're given the option to stay undetected when entering a new area as enemies are unaware of your presence until you fire an unsilenced weapon or you move into their line of sight. Then there's about four or five missions where you're forced into stealth with it being a mission restart if you're caught and these are largely just a mess of trial and error. Bond's car keys can be used as a taser and he also has a fountain pen which fires out limited trank darts but these are still the shoddiest areas in the game. During one stealth mission, there's a part near the end that is literally unpassable if you've run out of tranquilizer darts, forcing a mission restart and setting you back a good 10 or 15 minutes. Another factor that doesn't help is that the enemies don't make any audible sound when they're walking around, forcing you to lean around every single corner. And when you are detected, which happens within one hundredth of a second, they run to the nearest alarm panel with lightning speed and it's an instant mission fail. <laughs> The PS2 version gives you a dart gun with a whole heap more ammo, making the corresponding missions much, much easier. The stealth also seems to be a bit more generous in this version as well, with enemies taking seconds to react to your presence. It's not perfect, but it's a damn sight better than it is on the PC. Hey, where do you think you are going? Overall, I'd say the PC version of Nightfire is about three to four hours, whereas the console version took me almost double that time, closing in at seven or eight hours, mostly because I just kept dying. When you look back at 2002, it was a pretty good year for gaming, especially for first person shooters. I mean, we got Medal of Honor, Allied Assault, Serious Sam, No One Lives Forever 2, and Time Splitters, and amongst all of these heavyweights, Nightfire looks pretty damn average. The compatibility issues for the PC also compounds its problems further. I mean, this is a bit of an asshole to get running on Windows 7. The only way I could even get it working was to download a fan-made executable from the internet, but even then, I frequently had to restart the program due to graphical glitches. And I had various other issues with performance as well. It's a bit of a bummer and just more reason to overlook it when those other aforementioned games have practically no issues running in modern operating systems. And now compare that to the PS2 version where all you literally need is a working console and a controller. Boom, load it up and you're in Sunny Jim. I mean, sure it looks like shit, but it still functions as it did in 2002. I guess the only downside to playing Nightfire on the consoles is that the controls kinda suck. I mean, it's really sluggish and feels like it has input delay. Look, I don't care what anyone says, FPS games are always inferior with a controller and I think the only game series to ever get it right was Time Splitters. It's ironic too because the PS2 version really does try to do so many different things and make a genuine effort to keep variety between all the missions. It's just that none of them are really all that enjoyable. It's widely agreed that James Bond Everything or Nothing is the best James Bond game for the sixth generation of consoles. And I think that Agent Under Fire even beats out Nightfire because it's a lot less frustrating to play. The only other James Bond FPS we got for the PS2 was a couple years later with GoldenEye Rogue Agent, which is easily one of the worst FPS games ever made for the PS2, and just a shitty game in general. You can totally tell they just called it GoldenEye to cash in on the popularity of the original Nintendo 64 title, but it has nothing to do with it whatsoever, and it's about as fun as sticking chopsticks up your pee hole. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Aside from the novelty as playing as James Bond, Nightfire has very little to offer. The only reason to ever play it is if you've got a serious hard on for the character and feel like you really need to play every single James Bond game ever made. And if you're going to play it, look, ultimately I would suggest the PS2 version or the GameCube or whatever, which you should be able to pick up real cheap. But when all is said and done, James Bond Nightfire left me feeling stirred, not shaken. Is that dress standard company issue, Nightshade? Don't get any ideas, 007. It's armored in all the right places.